Good morning, everyone. Um, I was reminded of Wes's age when he said checkbook. <laughs> I don't think I've had a checkbook for like a decade and a half. Um, I use things like apps and phones and the internet. Anyway, we are so blessed to be in 2023, and um, I'm starting off the year hopefully with a bang. And as is often the case when we are here, the uh, hymns stole my thunder. Um, we are so blessed to have someone who can play piano, and the hymns are so powerful, such a wonderful summary of Scripture. Not just the words, not just the thoughts, but even with tune in it, and that's a blessing. Um, before we open Scriptures, I'm going to start with prayer, and I'll continue on where Nelson has, for the last few weeks, led us, which is through the book of John. And the Lord in my heart has been, for the last few weeks, put John 14 in my heart. And so we'll pray for that, preach for that, and walk through Scripture this morning. Let's bow our heads. Holy Lord, we thank you that we can be here together. We thank you that before eternity began, you made us. You knew that we would be here. You redeemed us. And you brought us together. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that empowers us and makes us love you. That you've taken us from death to life. That we can open your word. Your word is which is more sure than the world we are in. Your word which does not change. Your word which is one of the few things that will be in heaven. All things will be made anew. But your word will be forever. We pray this morning, Lord, for those who are here, who are lost, that your Holy Spirit, through the words, will convict them of their sin. We pray, Lord Jesus, that this morning, as we study your scriptures, that we will come to a deeper knowledge of you, that we will love you more, that we will seek to live holier in your holy name. Amen. All right, so let's start by reading through the text. Open your Bibles at uh, John 14, verse 1 to 15. And I've entitled my sermon, The Claim of Christ. So let's start at verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you have come to know me, you will know my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Then Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all so long and you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak from myself, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, as with all texts in Scripture, before we delve into it and walk through it verse by verse, I think it's very important to understand the context. The best way to get context is to just read the chapters before and after, and then you sort of know where you are at. 
And this morning, this particular part of Jesus' scripture comes in the middle of communion, which we will have today. So I think it's very pertinent and very important that we sort of understand that this is part of the communion Christ is talking about. So this was preceded by, in the previous chapter, chapter 13, the Lord's Supper. So this was the last time Jesus sat together with his disciples before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, before his eventual crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. So by way of introduction, I'm going to just read John 1, verse 14, which says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And very importantly, that word dwelt, um, if you go back to the regional language, is it's actually the word tabernacle. So that's very important to understand. Christ was literally the temple of God amongst us. He tabernacled or lived amongst us. That's really very important because if you don't understand that, all of a sudden these verses in chapter 14 don't make any sense. Chapter 13 starts with insightful words that Jesus was about to depart out of this world to the Father. He says that, that he loved those who belonged to him. Those in context of chapter 13 is his disciples. He loved them until the end and throughout his whole ministry, despite knowing that for a while they would forsake him. So Jesus' love in the preceding chapter was seen, first of all, in his knowledge of what was yet to come. Christ knew that he was going to be forsaken by his disciples. And yet, Christ obeyed. He directly mentions that he loves his disciples, and Christ serves them. What does he do in chapter 13? He washes their feet. And interestingly, when he washes their feet, who was included amongst the twelve? Judas. And Judas was his betrayer, his enemy. So Jesus treated Judas the same way he treated all the other disciples, with the same love, with the same servanthood. And that's what we mean when we think about the servant king. In the economy of God, in the world of God, it's very different. He leads by example. And that's how our sovereign is different than any other sovereign that I've ever seen. Everyone tells you what to do, but no one shows you how to do it. Where Christ showed us how to do it and continually does so. Servanthood defined is love in action. And I think that's what we need to understand. To serve our brothers and to serve those who are lost, to serve our enemies is love in action. What else does Jesus do? He shows his love by telling them what will happen. What does that prove? It proves his deity. And that's a word I'll be circling back to many times as we study through the scriptures this morning. Because the whole theme of the book of John is Jesus is God. Jesus commands his disciples to love one another. He says, by this all men will know that you belong to me if you love one another. And again, love is obedience and servanthood is love and action. Chapter 15 follows chapter 14, obviously. And in chapter 15, he talks about the Holy Spirit, which I'm not going to touch upon. That's a, a whole volume of servant, sermons by themselves. So I'm just going to focus on chapter 14. In chapter 14, Christ shows that he is our great servant. He provides us comfort through the Holy Spirit when trials come. He also provides us with a powerful example of how to serve and whom to serve and how to serve our enemies. Jesus never asked us to do something he did not think or do himself when he was on earth. So often other people give us a high bar. They tell us what they want us to do, but don't do themselves. Christ did it all himself, and then he said, aim for this, and we know we can't achieve that goal. We can strive through it through the power of the Holy Spirit, but we will never reach it perfectly as Christ did. This chapter is very important. Why is this chapter so important? What follows is... A tremendous trial for Christ, a tremendous trial for his disciples, for those closest to him. And this is important because, as Wes has prayed this morning, one of the things you can hear is there are people in our church going for trials. And if you haven't gone through a trial, then you're not a human being. But if you have gone through a trial, you'll go for more. The one thing we know is they will come. 
They can be difficult, they can be hard, but there is joy in the suffering, and we'll walk through that this morning and talk about how Christ gets us through trials and why he sends them. The first place to start is to realize in this chapter that Jesus starts by talking about whom he is. He is indeed God. He is supernatural, he's ascetic, he's the uncreated one, he is God. And that's a very important place for us to start as humans. To first of all know that we are created and that we have a creator. We are not alone in the universe. We were made. And sometimes this idea sounds like a fairy tale. But if you look at the life of Christ and you look at scripture, you know it to be true. Jesus provides encouragement for trials by reminding us who he is. That he is in absolute control of everything. He knows and directs the future. And he has given us scripture. Jesus shows us the rewards to come if we can go through trials, and that's very important, and I'll walk through that a bit later and talk about that reward. And lastly, again, the Holy Spirit. So let's start in verse 1, and I'll walk through it verse by verse, and as I go through the verses, we'll do some exegesis around them so you can see where we're going and where Jesus was going when he was speaking with his disciples. So verse 1 and 2, Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Here, very obviously, in verse 1, Jesus puts himself at the same level of God. He says, believe in God, believe in me as well. And there is abundant verses in the whole of the book of John to prove that Christ is God incarnate. In fact, do yourself a favor, you can actually watch the uh, Gospel According to John on YouTube now. We still have the old DVDs, but you can watch it on YouTube. It's about three and a half hours long. It's all in one sitting, and it is astonishing if you watch it. The one message that's so clear is Christ is God. Christ is God. In fact, it almost gets tedious when you get to some of the chapters where the Jews ask him, who do you say you are? And it's like, for the millionth time, I'm God. You know, so go through it. You'll get the point. You'll get John's point. We often miss that because we only read small sections or portion. But when you go through the whole book, the point is Jesus is God's son. Jesus is God. He motivates the disciples by pointing out reward. And the reward is in verse 2. And my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So he promises them reward. And so what does Jesus promise as reward? Does he promise prestige? Does he promise wealth? Power? He doesn't even promise heaven. What does he really promise? He promises us fellowship. He promises us that the reward is to be with God, to be where God is. Heaven is not the prize. Heaven is merely the place where the prize is. The prize is God. That's what makes Christianity so different from any other religion in the world. All other religions promise you the world when you die. You know, you get wealth and health and whatever. Um, Women, you name it. All these things that you're not going to need in eternity. What does Christianity promise us? We get fellowship with God. That's what matters. We get to be with our Creator for all eternity. There is a fantastic sermon to listen to if you have time by a guy called Michael Reeves. He's a professor who studies uh, the Puritans, and he recently did a very good sermon on the attributes of God, written by a Puritan called Stephen Charnock. If you have time, read his two volumes. Um, I think it's about 1,800 pages, small print. It's a really good read, and the middle part, it's a chiastic structure. A lot of the Bible is written like like a pyramid, the points in the middle. And uh, Stephen Charnock's book is written like that as well. And the whole book is really about what is God like? And the thing you learn from the Puritans is this. You learn in the Puritans' world, they revolve around God. God does not revolve around us. In our modern world, everyone thinks God's there for us. He's not. We are there for Him. He is the Creator. We are there to serve, obey, and love Him. And eventually, we will be with Him for all eternity.
Let's turn to Luke 22, verse 39 to 44. And he, Jesus, came out and went as he was accustomed to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When I, when he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Verse 43, which is the important verse I want you to look and see. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. That verse 43 is only found in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke adds this. And the question is, why does Luke add this little verse, which the other Gospels don't add? It's because it talks about the humanity of Christ. So what Christ was going to go through was a tremendous trial. And there was only one thing Christ was afraid of, only one trial that was difficult for him, and that was to be forsaken by his father. We often can't understand any of that because we've not been in perfect fellowship with a holy being for all eternity. Christ has. And Christ knew the price of sin. Christ knew what the cross meant because he is God. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he, in his humanity, he prays to the Father in verse 42 and he says, Lord, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to be forsaken by you but I will obey. And God shows him in his humanity reward. What's the reward? He sends him an angel. What does the angel do? The angel strengthens him. The angel worships him. So that's the point of that verse. It points to the humanity of Christ. Even Christ gives us a reward. God the Father showed Christ reward as well. He showed him what is the end of obedience. It's worship. Hebrews 4, verse 15 to 16. We all know this verse is quite well, and I love them dearly because it shows me that Christ understands when I go for suffering and pain. Verse 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ understands our pain and suffering. And Christ, when he went through temptation, he prayed, he spent time with the Father, he depended on the Father, and God showed him the reward to come. That's true for us too. When we go for trials, think about the reward. Life is brief. Pain and suffering is brief. And we by God's grace, will never go for the same suffering Christ did. Death is scary. None of us know how we're going to die. You know, some of us are afraid of drowning and burning and all these terrible things, but you know what? It ends. And even if you go through that, the one thing you never get to go through is being forsaken by God. Only Christ went through that so that we never have to go through that. We can't even imagine what that means because we've never been forsaken by God. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So in my studies regarding verse 3, some people talk about that as a proof text for the rapture of the saints. I don't think you can read that there. It's not very clear. I think if you look at the exegesis of Scripture, you have to read things in. I don't like reading things in. The point of that verse, I think, is just simply that Christ will come again. We know that, and later as Scripture is completed and we have the canon of Scripture, we get the book of Revelation, which explains that Christ will come again. So that, again, is reward. Christ will come to reward. And the reward is Him. We will be with Him. Notice also that in that verse that Christ is the one that is the, is the impetus to power, the one that is doing the going, the coming, and the receiving. Pointing towards the sovereignty of Christ and salvation. So that's a good verse to memorize and put in your memory banks about the sovereignty of Christ and salvation. 
Verse 4 and verse 5. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus was very gracious there. Jesus walked with the disciples for three years. They saw his miracles. They saw his power. They saw he was, how he lived, what he thought. And they asked him this silly question. We do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Even later, when Peter said, look, I will not forsake you. Even there, Jesus pointed towards the future and said, you will forsake me, but you will come back. He was not annoyed by Thomas's ignorance. Instead, he gives him verse 6. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but or except through me. This is a very important verse in the book of John. In fact, there is seven I am statements throughout the book of John. The I am statements uh, point towards the deity of Christ. And just quickly running through them, um, John 6 verse 35, I am the bread of life. John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. 10 verse 7, I am the gate for the sheep. 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. This verse, which is I am the way and the truth and the life. And the last one is I am the true vine. Those are the seven I am statements in the book. Again, pointing towards Jesus is God. Jesus teaches an extremely narrow path to God. There are no alternatives to him. But at least, through God's mercy, we have a way. I know there's only one way to God, but at least there's a way. God could not have provided us with any way towards him. He could have left us in our darkness and dead, but he did not. And many people are very offended by this verse. How can it be so narrow? How can there only be one way towards God? Surely there must be more. Surely God must be more gracious than that. And I think people ask that question because of two reasons. The first is they don't understand how evil we are. They don't understand our depravity. The second one is they don't understand the holiness of God. It cost God, God, for us to be forgiven. That's how expensive sin is. People miss that part. In fact, the whole book of, uh, in the thesis that Charnak puts about the, the characteristics of God, the pinnacle is the holiness of God. The middle chapter is all about what it's like um, and God's holiness. And that's very important because without God's holiness, God is a tyrant. Imagine a God that's got all the power in the universe, <clears throat> he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and he's not holy. That would be terrifying. You'd have this pernicious God who can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, to whoever he wants, without love, without a standard. Jesus in that verse says that he is the truth. So again, John 1, 14, I am the word become flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace. So the word and the truth are linked to each other. He's also the life, John 3, verse 15, so that whoever believes in him, or Christ, have eternal life. There's other proof texts in Scripture and well that talk about the fact that there's one narrow gate, and Matthew 7, 13, 14 is a fantastic verse for that. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Again, Matthew 7 teaches the exclusivity of Christ. It is a narrow gate because God is holy. <clears throat> Acts 4 verse 12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given amongst men by which we must be saved. Again, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. God teaches, Christ teaches, an extremely narrow path to him. Verse 7. If you've come to know me, you'll know my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. And Jesus indeed was the invisible 
was the visible image of the invisible God. He was the imprint of God. God amongst us, the God that tabernacled amongst us. Verse 8 to verse 11. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you show, say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The word that I say to you, I do not speak from myself, but the Father abiding in me does these works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. <clears throat> so Christ is talking about his deity and then Philip catches on to what Christ is saying but misses the point. Christ talks about he is the visible image of the Father, and Philip asks him something silly. He says, oh, Lord, show us proof. And I ask for a very simple proof. What's the proof? I just want to see the Father. Does anyone know what happens if you see the Father? <laughs> Exodus 33, verse 20. God said to Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. So, Surely Philip knew this. I'm sure he studied the Old Testament like the rest of the disciples. I'm sure Christ said this to him. But Philip asked this really silly question. He says to Jesus, just do this impossible thing for me. If you can do this impossible thing, I'll believe in you. Just show me the Father. And Jesus is perturbed. Jesus' answer is, but you've seen me. I am Christ. I am the one that is. You know, he just said, I am the vine. So again, claiming his deity, his whole life showed his deity, his miracles showed his deity, and Philip asked this silly question, show us the Father. We are like that too. We look at the universe and everything that is, and then we go like, oh, God, show us a sign. We want to know that you're there. And the reality is the evidence is overwhelming. And that's not enough for us. We want a miracle. Jesus answers him in a very interesting way. So if you go back to those verses, Jesus says something quite interesting. <coughs> he doesn't say to Philip, first of all, yeah, sure, I'll show the Father, because Jesus knows Scripture. Jesus knows God. And Jesus doesn't say, believe in me because of all the things I've done. What does he say? He says, believe in my word. So even when Jesus was asked about you know, miracles, Jesus' answer is, believe the words I say, John 14, 10. That which I say to you trumps the miracles. And then he says to, to Philip, and if you don't want to believe in that, then at least believe in the miracles. But he makes the miracles secondary. That's very important for us to understand. We don't believe that Jesus is God because of the miracles he did, although they prove that he is God. We believe that Jesus is who he says he is because of his word. That is the point. So if you liken that to 2 Peter 1, verse 16 to 21, <clears throat> it says in 2 Peter, and this is specifically the disciples um, talking, Peter talking when he writes about the word, he says, For we did not make known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, following cleverly devised myths, but being eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such is an utterance that was made by him by the majestic glory this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So when the disciples lived with him, they heard the voice from heaven when Jesus was baptized. We ourselves heard the utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So when Jesus was there with the, um, Elijah and with Moses, they heard God speak. They say in verse 19, we have the more sure prophetic word. To which you do, do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day the dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes by one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the will of man. But men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So the insight you get from this is that the proof that Jesus is who he says he is, is not from his miracles. In fact, 2 Peter tells you that. The disciples were there when Jesus did all the miracles, all the time. They were there when God spoke to him at his baptism. They were there when God spoke to Jesus on the mountain. And how do they know that Jesus is God? Verse 19, 2 Peter 1. 
the more sure prophetic word. You know how you know Jesus is God? Because of the Bible. The word of God tells you Jesus is God. Jesus himself, when he spoke to the disciples, says, how do you know I am God? You see my life, but hear my word. And then if you don't want to believe my word, believe in the miracles. We know from history that miracles do not save people. Not miracles in the way we think of them. The best miracle is when God, through the power of his word, and the Holy Spirit transforms someone's life. Moving from death to life, from hatred of God to love of God, kingdom of darkness to heaven, that is a miracle. But it's one you can't evidently see. Not the way we think about miracles. We think of miracles as walking on water, calming storms, and raising people from the dead. The latter one God does do. He raises us from the dead by giving us a new heart. Some good examples would this be what we sang this morning and what we read in Deuteronomy. Israel. Israel was in Egypt. They saw the plagues. They went through the desert. They saw miracle upon miracle. God fed them for 40 years. Did those miracles save them? No. Only two of them went into the promised land. They weren't saved by miracles. It's the word of God that saves. In fact, Jesus himself in John 2, verse 23 to 25 says, Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men. And because he had no need that anyone bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. The most powerful supernatural proof of God is Scripture. If you look at the universe, the universe we see gives us a natural revelation of who God is, but the supernatural you can only get from the Bible. This needs to be made alive through the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit can't work without Scripture. You need to have to give someone the gospel before God can transform them. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Um, in my charismatic days, I've heard that verse often, often out of context. Um, I don't think I'll ever play you know, American football or be a top basketball player. So I certainly can't do anything if I believe in Jesus. Out of context, you can do anything with that verse. But in context, what is that verse talking about? Can we do the same things that Christ did from a miraculous perspective? And the answer to that is yes and no. I certainly can't walk in water. I can't raise people from the dead physically. But we can raise people from the dead spiritually. How do we do that? We give them the gospel. We pray for them. So we can't in quality do what Christ did. I don't have his power. I'm not God. But we can certainly give the gospel to by far more people. Because when Christ was on earth in his humanity, he was limited to one place. He was not all across the world giving the gospel to everyone at the same time. But we, in volume and amount, can go around and give people the gospel. So we can do more than Christ in the sense that we can share the gospel with more people. And the miracle of God's transforming power through the word and the scripture happens in more people. But certainly not the same quality as of Christ's gifts and powers, because he is God. Verse 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Again, another two verses I've often heard out of context. These verses have to be taken together with Christ's teaching on how we should pray. And here specifically asking in Christ's name has to do with asking according to his will. Jesus was talking about a time of trial and temptation that was about to come on the disciples. His crucifixion was about to happen. And so he tells his followers, this is what you ask for and how you ask. You need to ask in according to my will or his word. For the purpose of God's kingdom and for Christ and God's glory, based upon the character and promise of Christ and not our merit. And that's what it means, Jesus' name. 
So whenever we pray in Jesus' name, what we mean is not on our merit, but on the merit of Christ. So the purpose of prayer is to have a closer relationship with God. Spurgeon said that prayer was the nerve that moves the arms of omnipotence. Prayer is real and prayer has power. But the purpose of prayer is to focus on God and on others, not on ourselves. Why? Because we already love ourselves too much. Prayer is not for us. Prayer is for God's kingdom, for His will, according to His word, and for those around us who are lost. And that brings us to verse 15. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, and something I, early on in my Christian walk, learned. Before I was a Christian, I never really understood what love meant. Um, I always felt love was this romantic emotion. But love in God's kingdom certainly includes emotion, but what it truly is, is obedience. It's not a love that's superficial. It's a love that translates into determination, into action, into doing, into obedience. So Jesus ends this section where he's talking about the trials that are supposed to come for his disciples by talking about love. And in his economy, love is obedience. How do we see that? The best example is Jesus. Jesus loved the Father. How did he love the Father? He loved the Father by becoming human. He gave up his deity, became incarnate, and deity incarnate came to earth. He walked amongst us. He lived holy life. He contended with frail human beings who hated him, who sinned against him. And then he went to the cross, knowing perfectly the pain and punishment that he was about to undergo, and that it was to be forsaken by the Father. And he did that because of his love or obedience for the Father. What Christ endured by God's grace, we never have to. So when you walk through those verses, verses 1 through 15, the point of Christ was to show his disciples the comfort in the trials about to come. The seven things I want to bring out of it is to first start off by talking about the deity of Christ. When you go through trials, you need to understand that Jesus Christ is God. God has all the power, all the strength, and he can help us through our trials. We need to then secondly understand humility, the servanthood of Christ. How do you get through a tough time as a Christian? You do the next right thing. You obey. You serve. You don't revile. You don't get angry. You don't fight back. You serve and you obey. We realize that only Christ provides access to God. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other way in this universe to have a relationship with God. And there is reward. In fact, um, Paul talks about that. He said how, how we should be you know, cursed above all else if there's no heaven, if there's no God, if there's no reward. We aren't just Christians because we're trying to be good. We are Christians because there is reward. And the reward is the fellowship with God. As I said earlier, heaven is merely the dwelling place of God. It's not the point. The point is the relationship we will have with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit for all eternity. These verses also point that the supernatural proof of God is, above all else, Scripture, more so than miracles. The universe is enough to condemn those who are unsaved to eternity of hell, but not save them. We need supernatural truth to be saved, and that is Scripture. We need to learn to ask Christ to help us according to his will. God does have the power to take away trials. He has the power to do whatever he wants. So when the trial comes, the question you have to ask yourself is not, you know, Lord, please take away this trial. The question you should ask is, why am I going through this trial? What is God trying to teach me? What do I need to change? How do I need to grow? How can I see God's love more? Trials have an excellent purpose. They purify us. 
if God didn't love us, he would not send us trials. He would just leave us be. But because God loves us, he makes life tough so that we yearn for heaven and yearn to be with him. We need to learn that love is obedience. It's very easy to say all these things. It's very easy to talk about all these things. But I think end of the day, Nelson always says this, you know, do you believe it? Do you actually believe it? Is this just words to you or does it transform your heart and your mind? Does it reach inside you and grasp you and turn you towards Christ? So the claim of Christ is that he's God. The claim of Christ is that he's there for us. That he will be with us if we ask according to his will. That there is reward. There is reward in this life. But more importantly, there's eternal reward. And the reward is him. Before we go to communion, let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that we could have opened your scriptures this morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we speak with you, we know you hear. We love you, Lord, because you have first loved us. We love you because you've saved us. We love you, Lord, because you are not silent. You speak with us every day through the Holy Spirit. You speak with us in your scripture. You tell us how to think after you. You tell us how to live as you've lived. And more importantly, Lord, you don't just give us a standard in word. You gave us a standard in life. You came to earth being humble. You lived amongst us and you obeyed perfectly as a human being. You understand temptation. You understand suffering. You understand humanity because you were human. We thank you that you have also given us the means by which we can obey you. That you have given us a new heart, a new mind, scripture, and your Holy Spirit. We pray this morning, before we start communion, that for us here who have sins in our hearts against our brothers and sisters, that we will repent of them. For those of us who are saved, Lord, communion is a commandment. It's not something we can skip. The commandment of the Scripture is that when there is sin in our lives, that we repent of it and we deal with it. Otherwise, judgment will come upon us. Amen.